Uh, we're live. Everybody, this is the Impact Fashion Podcast. Great to have you all here. We are interviewing Savion Slane Hayes of the Virginia Kemp Company, Yvette Castro of Fashion Fights Poverty, and Bianca Alexander of Conscious Living TV and Fashion Revolution Day. Thank you all for being here once again, and this panel is going to talk a lot about just what all of our panelists, companies are, and organizations, how they have been involved in increasing social impact within the fashion industry, and we're going to start asking them some questions right now. So, for, and in case you haven't met each other before, now you know, this is Savion, Yvette, Same and Bianca. Savion. <laughs> How's everybody doing tonight? Excellent. How are you? I'm amazing. Oh, wonderful. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, we're going to ask questions for each of you, pretty much the same questions. And the first one is for Savion. Where, when did you get started with your organization, the Virginia Hemp Company? Um, well, the company got started in 2011 when I moved back here to Virginia from Roman DC. When I moved to Virginia from California, I was in California working at Warner Brothers um, door marketing. And um, while I was out there, I discovered all things cannabis and hemp. I became a Prop 215 medical cannabis patient. Um, I got interactive with the um, activists in California and met a lot of the patients and really learned everything about the cannabis and hemp industry while out there. Um, I marketed for three collectives. Um, I worked for Cannabis Planet TV, so it was an amazing experience for me in, in California. But when I did my, my research on the industry, I learned that um, hemp had its original history here in America, starting in the original colony in Virginia. So, you know, being a, a Virginia boy, I, I decided to come back home and, and be one of the first people on the um, front for Virginia industrial hemp, recreational cannabis, and medical cannabis. And since then, it's been an uphill battle, but now we are seeing the prohibition pretty much dissolve and it's opening doors for everything industrial hemp. And fashion is definitely a, um, a big thing for me because I am in the entertainment industry. My, my background is in entertainment business. I'm a full cell university graduate in media communications and entertainment business. Um, you know, so fashion is incorporated in music and, and, and modeling. You know, we deal with um, a lot of talent. Um, I've dealt with fashion designers. I've been in cutting sew rooms where we actually, you know, creating fashion from scratch. And once I learned um, the potential of hemp around, you know, 2009, 2010, and 2011, incorporating it into the fashion industry was one big thing that I wanted to do. Because at one point, hemp was the, probably I would say the equivalent to cotton. Um, we used hemp for all of our fibrous materials at one point until the prohibition. Um, started and much of the prohibition was to protect uh, cotton interests and other um, timber interests. You know, so bringing hemp back into the fashion industry is going to be an amazing feat. Companies like Levi's, for instance, they've um, their original pants were made out of hemp canvas. Um, so we've you know facilitated plans to Levi's to try to bring some hemp denims back to the market. H um, and M is now the largest uh, buyer of hemp uh, fibers in the commercial world. Um, you know, so it's a lot of good stuff going on. I'm excited. We start Hemp Research July 1st in Virginia, and fashion is definitely a big thing that we're going to be um, incorporating our, our research for. Awesome. Thank you. For, um, for UN Week, um, that happens in, every year in October. But that year is the 60th anniversary, and we had a big gala called Fashion Fights Poverty. Um, I started as a volunteer, I was helping backstage um, and as like a model liaison, um, coordinating with, the, with between the designers and the models. And um, after um, being involved with the with the event and meeting the co the original co-founders of the organization, Sylvie, Michael, and, and Patrika, um, I was I was blown away and had a lot of questions. And everything that I wasn't the only one. There were a lot of us that we were just had this adrenaline rush to like move forward and do more. 
And um, it was uh, Michael, Michael Dumla, who is uh, he's the creative director, one of the co-founders of the organization. He um, started this thing, let's do a lookbook. And we called it um, Dress Responsibly. And from there, it was like more questions, and it grew, and people were just asking like, um, how, okay, fashion fest party, how does fashion fight poverty? What does that mean? Um, what can I do? Um, like, what, what is it all about? And we really um, grew into, um, you know, uh, into an organization where we serve as, as an education and advocacy group. Um, so we educate people about eco-sustainable and ethical fashion and teach people about being more socially responsible. Um, and not only that, but we also work with designers and work with, with retailers and work with just different facets of the fashion industry and, um, and, and teach them that there is a market for it. And one of our biggest pieces as we've gone through, I mean, I started, as I said, I started as a model liaison, as a, you know, as a production liaison, and then grew into this role of um, research and programs because I really feel that you know the, the, the programs that is really the core mission of our organization. We really can um, use fashion as a tool to help alleviate poverty. And that's through learning more about being eco-sustainable and ethical. And um, as I said, the biggest piece of it is education and teaching the future. So um, over the past four years, we've really concentrated on our summer programs um, um, and our summer camp in teaching um, students from middle school and high school about what it is to be socially responsible. Um, what's, what is um, eco-fashion? What is ethical fashion? What is fair wage, fair trade, sweatshop free? And about you know, more in, being more engaged in, um, in their style and knowing that their style is not just about the designers but the people behind the designs. Great. Happy to be here and uh, such an illustrious group of people doing such unique work. I think there are so many different um, touch points on the continuum um, that we are all sort of committed to making um, our best effort to move the needle forward and there's a lot of different ways to do that. So my, my company is um, Conscious Living TV. Uh, we are a lifestyle show now in our ninth season um, covering uh, and highlighting the latest in health, wellness, and sustainability. Um, we launched the show uh, back uh, in uh, California um, where we um, had spent many years just working in media and sort of looking for me as an attorney on the business affairs side for a big movie studio, just looking and seeing all the amazing um, opportunities and reach that, that media, particularly television, has to educate, empower, and inspire. And, you know, we decided to stop complaining about all the negativity of mainstream news, which is, you know, pretty much committed to one thing, profits, and if it bleeds, it leads, and that's why, you know, one of the best ways to <laughs> minimize depression is don't watch the news, don't read the newspaper. Um, and so we decided to be a part of the solution. And uh, we cover um, everything from yoga to um, spirituality, meditation, green travel, ecotourism, and ethical fashion, which is definitely one of our most popular categories. And it's just been exciting being a part of the movement as we've seen even just the past nine years, 10 years since we've been around, um, the evolution not only of the, um, you know, the, the types of design subjected to truly inhumane conditions so that we can have cheap clothes and the clothes fall apart and they're made with toxins and we have to throw them away and then start over again. And so this whole fast fashion cycle is what the Fashion Revolution campaign and movement is really about putting it into by just bringing more awareness to the people that make our clothes and, 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 and really resetting the buying criteria, which is a big piece of what our, our television show and our company Conscious Living is about, is that people can begin to rethink what fashion actually is. You know, if someone has to die for a t-shirt, to me that's not beautiful fashion. So, happy to be here. Thank you. Our next question is, uh, when you first came to DC, uh, what inspired you to come here? What inspired you to get involved in fashion or uh, organizing and media in this area? And we'll start with Savion. Why DC? Um, I guess I look at DC more as, as the being of the so to speak, DC, Maryland, Virginia area. I'm an army brat, that's why I'm in this area one. Um, I left Germany um, 
came to Virginia um, back in 98, and I've lived all over the state since then. Um, but I, when I left Virginia, like most other Virginians and D.C. people do to try to make it in the entertainment industry, we leave the state because there's not too many creative opportunities here. Um, everything's in California, New York, uh, Florida. But when I got to California, it seemed um, it was a bit oversaturated. Um, I guess I'm somewhat of a, a rebel in the, in the entertainment industry. I was um, entry level um, marketing at Warner, and you know, I just I, I go against the grain a little bit, you know, about thinking consciously. In a sense, I'm not for a lot of things that the the, the mainstream media stands for, the, the content that they decide to fund and promote. Um, so it was always me bumping heads with some of the executives, um, some of my higher ups at at the higher um, the company. So making the decision to come back to the DMV um, as a marketing man, we look at trends. And for me in the music industry, um, each area is almost had like a ten year run. New York had its like ten year run. California had a good ten year run. Atlanta, they when they came out with Lil Jon, and, um, Lil Jon and the Yin Yang Twins, and they since that was around 2000, 2011. And I think the DMV area is going to be the next hub of entertainment. It's going to be the next focus for uh, creative careers, artists, models, uh, fashion designers. Um, so I want to make sure that I'm part of this next, what I call the Renaissance, um, that I believe is going to spark this, this, this era of creativity that the world hasn't seen in such a long time. Because um, commercial entertainment has been more focused on creating cookie cutter fashion, cookie cutter artists, cookie cutter technology. Um, and I think it's time to, you know, with 3D print technology hitting the scene, the face of manufacturing is gonna change. And DC is gonna play a big role in that simply because our government is here. Um, you know, so it's gonna be a lot of the companies that are gonna be playing politics, trying to assure their position in a new age of fashion. Um, you know, with how, how she was saying, with solar panels and getting incorporated into into fashion, I, I, I anticipate a lot of our fashion in a sense to be more interconnected with us in the next coming um, 10 to 20 years to where it's not just going to be an article of clothing, but um, something that we're more or less going to depend on and is really going to, fashion is going to really start helping people create their identities um, in the world and it's not just going to be, you know, how much, what, what, what name brand in a sense you're wearing but I'm really hoping that fashion comes to the point to where the name brand doesn't really matter, but the person that's wearing the fashion really is what accentuates what the, that article of clothing is for. You know, so my role really is to, um, you know, I guess as, as a young black man, uh, you know, teach others that it's cool to, to experiment with different fashions. I, I used to do the, do the tall tees, the fitted hats, the jeans sagging down by my knees and everything, you know, 26 now and my whole fashion look has changed and I, you know, it gets boring after a while. I feel, you know, men's fashion has been the same for, for such a long time. We've had the, the button ups and the, and the vest and the slacks and I, I, I'm, I'm anticipating some new stuff to happen in the coming years of um, fashion. I'm, I'm hoping to be a part of it um, real heavily and like I said, as far as incorporating the hemp technology into it, we, we're planning to make a way better um, system of manufacturing, you know, with situations, you said that factory um, incident happened in Bangladesh, you know, so simple stuff like utilizing hemp lumber and, and, and hemp creed and other hemp technologies, we're doing tons of research with hemp plastics right now. Bangladesh and, and a lot of Asian um, countries are areas that are already growing hemp abundantly, and with if America takes its um, sets the example and decides to utilize hemp as our main resource, the, the world is going to follow. So we'll stop seeing incidents like that. You know, we have tons of infrastructure projects that we need to do here in our own country, so utilizing hemp um, for these infrastructure projects are going to be um, one thing that helps shed light on hemp as a resource. And the, the textile industry is going to boom once again once we start utilizing this um, abundant natural fiber versus the, the, the chemical fibers that DuPont has been making and um, the, the cotton industry right now, you know, there's tons of pesticides that go into our cotton fibers. Um, evidence is showing that, um, you know, some of those pesticides are causing cancers. You know, once we're wearing these clothes, all these chemicals are still seeping into our skin. Um, hemp, in a sense, doesn't need any pesticides or herbicides to grow, so we're going to eliminate that problem. Um, I didn't bring anything up here. I thought I brought some hemp cotton fiber. I could have had some, some hemp fibers right there. So just from those 
most fibers alone, we're making uh, tons of textile products. We're making paper out of those uh, out of those fibers. We're making plastics out of those fibers. Um, you know, so we're, we're creating a. And you can't smoke it. It's not going to get you high. You know, a lot of people try to crack jokes on it, but it's it's a non THC derivative. And with DC taking a stance on medical cannabis, recreational cannabis, Virginia just passed this industrial hemp bill. Maryland just passed this industrial hemp bill. This area is going to be a key key. Um, player in sustainable fashion. Companies like Adidas, they've already introduced hemp Adidas to the, to, to the market, so that's one of the contracts we're looking to bring here to Virginia, D.C., Maryland for manufacturing jobs. Um, to do a full line of, of hemp Adidas products, hemp baseball bats, hemp basketballs, um, hemp athletic wear. You know, so not just to stop that fashion for design purposes, but for, um, you know, for everyday use purposes for for the athletes, you know, the, the hemp fibers it allows for the body to, to breathe a little bit better, helps regulate our temperatures. Um, you know, so, so working with some of the industry leaders out here, we're going to bring tons of manufacturing jobs. A lot of companies are looking to come back to the United States from China right now. You know, so we're hoping those companies participate in helping build this industry. You know, a lot of people in my generation are, are struggling to get by, you know, so by having a, a large source of, of non chemical-based textiles, I think we can create more jobs. We can take the art of clothing making off of the complete mechanized process and actually start teaching people how to make clothing again and, you know, create create some some, some good stuff the world hasn't seen in a while, man. So, and I'll stop there and let somebody else talk. <laughs> Thank you. That was great. Yvette, same question. How did you find yourself working in the D.C. DMV area and what inspires you about this area and your industry? Um, why DC openness? That is a really loaded question because when I came to the, the area, I didn't come to the area thinking about anything but a day job. Um, I, my background is completely divergent from my um, nonprofit life. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm an engineer, that's my day job. Um, I don't, this wasn't what I was expecting. Um, but the thing of it was, as soon as we moved to the area and we started getting you know, engaged in the area, realizing that we have all of this infrastructure in our own backyard and, and to be able to lobby, to talk to our congressmen, to talk to, you know, to go to the Hill and actually talk about things, it was really a matter of finding what we're going to talk about. and. Um, First, it was about it was it was really about um, uh, fair wage, fair trade, and uh, other poverty poverty issues um, related to um, uh, the Millennium Development Goals and, and sustainability. And it was funny because we were just um, my boyfriend and I were sitting in a meeting um, uh, talking about different events that were coming up, and that's actually how I met um, the the organizers of what we thought was just this one little fashion. Um, I'd be involved in, um, in developing programs and extending curriculums and talking and being an advocate and, and, and trying to educate people about eco-sustainable and ethical fashion. So I joke and I say, I'm engineer by day, I'm eco-ethical activist by night. Uh -huh. um, because that's really, because I find myself doing it in my day, in my day job, I, I'm in my, involved in my day job, but my passion is is um, the organization, is eco-sustainable and ethical fashion. It is about educating people about social responsibility. It is educating people about what they wear is not just a designer. There are communities involved in what you wear. Um, there are hundreds of people involved in just one t-shirt. You know, going back to what um, Bianca said about the, the building collapse in Bangladesh, it wasn't just in that, that same year there was also the big fire in another factory in Cambodia. And these are things that you, know, you would think that people would, would be more um, aware um, that some of the, you know, the high street clothing that they wear from you know, the designers that you get at the mall, um, they were all involved, but we don't hear about it. And um, through the organization, through, you know, through Fashion Fights Poverty, that, that's actually what really motivated me to keep engaged was you know, helping extend that voice about what it is 
um, to, to really value what you wear. And not value it because it's some designer, but value it because there are entire, there are entire communities involved in what you wear. It's not just, you know, the, you know, when you look at magazines, it's not just the pretty people, pretty clothing aspect. It's also, you know, it's also all the communities and all the people who live off of what you wear. And um, that's really, you know, what I, I find myself becoming sort of the voice for those people. And that's what keeps me engaged. And being here in, you know, the, in the D.C. area, it's really been, it's been the best place to do that because we have, you know, we have Capitol Hill, we have all these, we have all this infrastructure in our own backyard. And um, it's just, you know, it, it, it becomes, um, I, I'd be, I would be remiss to not do it. You know, it, I have to do it because I'm here. You know, that sort of thing. Thank you. Bianca, same question. Also, how did you find yourself working? How did you find yourself working in the D.C. area? What led you here? And I'm going to add on, what obstacles have you found working in this industry in D.C.? Yeah, great question. I mean, I think... <laughs> panelists that came before me, I think, answered very articulately the Washington, D.C. area. I mean, obviously, this is where, you know, policy is being made, and there's so many thought leaders that come from around the world to be here to um, push forward agendas that are very much in alignment with, um, you know, consciousness and evolution and fair trade and social justice, and that's, you know, what our platform and the work that we do in the community is all about. Um, so I won't be redundant there. Um, as for me, I'm originally from, I was born and raised here in the D.C. area and um, actually trained as an attorney, um, licensed here in, in Washington, D.C. and I practiced for many years before getting into entertainment as an attorney and then eventually um, as a producer and behind the camera, in front, in front of the camera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and part of why I moved to L.A., similar to what you said, is that I felt that there was just, you know, a dearth of creative opportunities, for, you know, for me and the work that I wanted to do. Um, and at that time, I was still finding myself. I mean, like you, I was like moonlighting. Like by day, I was an attorney, and by night, I was an entertainment attorney. You know, slash host, slash you know um, event promoter, slash you know whatever slashes that I could I could you know sort of squeeze into a 24-hour day. Um, and it wasn't until I had the opportunity to work at Paramount in Hollywood that you know I was able to kind of begin to integrate. Um, you know, all those personalities, so to speak, into, into one job. Um, and, you know, at the time, I felt it did require me leaving the D.C. area because, you know, I felt, quite frankly, growing up, you know, being a native Washingtonian, I can say this, like, relative to, you know, California or even New York, like, you know, there is um, such a conservative culture um, that I found very limiting and very restricting to my creative expression and really just my own... Um, discovery and unfoldment of who I was as a person and who I'm here to be on the planet. And that was exactly what it needed to be to propel me to go out and sort of find myself and come back. And, you know, I, I'm not saying that it's not possible to have a very beautiful, budding, successful, thriving, creative life and creative, progressive, um, you know, platform and opportunities here. But at the time, for me, you know, I think I was just so mindset-wise, just deeply ingrained in that consciousness and that culture. So it wasn't until moving to California that, you know, I started meditating and, you know, practicing yoga, and I went vegetarian, I'm now raw vegan, and, you know, I'm a yoga teacher, and, you know, also still a trained attorney. So coming back full circle, you know, 10 years later, for me, was um, has really been a, a really powerful um, moment of full circle and integration to be able to say, okay, I'm strong enough now, I know enough about who I am and what I'm here to do, just, you know, I think by trial and error, finding out what works, what doesn't work, you know, the dream job that I thought was my dream job was actually a nightmare, you know, just in terms of the culture and the energy of the people that I worked with and sort of the focus of what they thought was important. It's like, okay, this is not, you're not creating peace here. You're creating a film that's mediocre and, you know, why are we pulling all-nighters? You know, it's like, I'd rather be putting my time and energy and effort and passion and talents all the years of education um, to making the world a better place. And I don't knock those who don't choose that as a, as a life career path, but um, for me, it really helped to integrate sort of the, my background and, and as an attorney and my background as a person who's an advocate for justice, and then marrying that with media um, 
which again has so much uh, potential to, to reach and educate um, just millions of people. It's like, okay, I could, you know, spend years writing books, I could be, you know, in a law classroom, I could be in a courtroom to make change, or I could use a platform like television and reach millions of people in five minutes, you know. Hmm, I think I'll pick television. So that's pretty much for me. And now being back here in the DC area, being able to um, you know, really meet um, the the movement, the wave of consciousness which is growing. And, um, and, and to really see Washington really opening up and evolving and becoming more progressive. We're having a conversation about ethical fashion right now, you know what I mean, on 7th Street, you know, downtown, you know. This is, this is a big movement and a sign that, you know, the movement is ready for consciousness and we need more sort of ambassadors and educators and, you know, torch holders to run and, and light the path. Uh, and continue to bring more energy to the movement. So, um, and then on top of that, as it as it turns out, um, we found a wonderful television studio that we now are shooting our show out of on a monthly basis. For, you know, right here in the DC area. So it's like, okay, isn't that funny? You know, like you know, it's kind of like the alchemist. You you go far away, pursue the dream, then you come back and realize it was in your backyard the whole time. <laughs> Great, thank you. Okay, next question is. What advice would you have for people interested in your work in fashion-related jobs and in this industry, both from your perspective and of the DC area perspective and of any other sort of areas that you've been in? And we can actually start from Bianca again. Yeah, um, yeah it's, a, it's a great question. And I think had I known what I know now when I left DC, left, but I definitely would have had, um, I think, a, a much clearer sense of kind of like what the path would be. And the advice I would give is, you know, first and foremost, um, be true to yourself. You know, I think there are um, so many years wasted, and I spent many years, and you know, you know, wasted, maybe learning lessons, um, trying to sort of fit myself, you know, a square peg into a round hole. Um, and sometimes it takes, and part of that I think is just the arrogance of thinking, oh, this is what I'm gonna do, and this is my job, and that's it, and not really being willing to um, go through the humbling experiences of, of failure, what may be perceived as failure from the outside, not having it all figured out, not having all the answers, not having your whole business plan, blah, 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 blah. That journey, that unfoldment, that transformative process is exactly what brought me to this point. You know, all the trials and errors, you know, going into situations and working in hostile working environments is what pushed me to to go deeper and to meditate and to sort of detox my body and detox my mind so that I could have a consciousness to actually say, wait a minute, I'm here for a purpose. Like I was born for a reason and it's unique and I need to get about the business of finding out what that is as opposed to sort of playing roles that mom and dad or whoever expects, you know, um, this is what a black woman from Washington DC should do. This is what we do. Um, and so I think, being willing to um, live life in a way that is very creative and messy and um, uncertain, like really embracing the uncertainty, particularly as an entrepreneur, that's all it's about. And you become, um, you build your character on that basis. And, and as a result, you create assets and talents and gifts that become invaluable in service to the world. Because ultimately, the most successful person is a person who um, is able to be of service to others. And you know, we live in a culture where it's all about me and selfies and I want to be rich and famous and American Idol and you know, overnight success, quote unquote. Um, and there, there's amazing talent out there, but that comes from that hard inner work um, so that the, you, know, you can be a star on the inside and the outside. So that would be the best advice I give myself at you know, 21 years old. Cool. Yvette, same question. What advice would you have for people interested in your work in fashion-related jobs and maybe even in engineering? <laughs> oh, goodness. Um, what advice would I give? Um, um, try everything. Don't limit yourself. That's probably the biggest piece of advice I can give to somebody. Um, that's something that I learned. Um, I learned when I moved here, that's not something that I, that um, you know, that I that I knew all along. I thought that I was going to, you know, be an engineer, work in a lab, and retire in a lab. I didn't 
realize how big the world was. And, you know, where we are right now with all the, you know, all the media and all the access and the internet and everything that we have around us, um, we can be anything. And that's really the advice that I would give somebody. You know, try it. If you, you know, you know, start it and finish it, and say that you tried it. And that's, that to me is the best advice I think I can give somebody um, in any arena, um, no matter you know, no matter who they are. Um, with regards to the fashion industry, be creative. You know, just um, find your find your voice in 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 the industry. Um, there, are, there's so many to stories that still can be told. It's not. Not just one point of view. It's not just you know, and, and it's not just what you see in the magazines or what you see in Fashion Week. It's more than that. It's bigger than that. Um, it, it, you know, it, you can be inspired by anything. Just you know, try everything and be inspired. That's really the, the best advice I can give somebody. Cool. Thank you so much. Savion, same question. Same question. Um, best advice. I would give to people is to learn to connect. Um, I think I'm, me as a businessman, I'm, I'm, take, I'm, I'm one of the new faces of what big business is going to be in the future. Um, and since we're on the subject of consciousness and energy and stuff, I'll, I'll give a little story real quick. Um, you know, the, the, the whole leaving the East Coast, going to California, and coming back home thing, you know, some of us, a lot of us out in Syria go through that story. Because we go out there with big dreams and big hopes, and we want to make it and be able to have our family and friends see us all on TV or something later on in life. Um, but it, it's something rewarding about going to California and having that experience. Um, while I was out there, I was able to connect with so many amazing people. As um, she said, you know, I, I got involved in meditation and yoga um, and, and I really started learning more about myself as a, as a being, so to speak. Um, and, and out in California, even though I am this, this aggressive business person, I learned that it is important to focus on uh, making sure that your, your, your business and what you do leaves a lasting impression and does something positive for the planet. And the only way as business people we can assure that is if we're able to connect to the people, connect to the, to the people that we're selling these products to, connect to the planet that we're getting our resources from. Um, and if as a... As a as a human being, if you're un, if you're unable to make those connections, it's kind of hard to to operate within the sustainability and, and, and eco kind of industry because it's more than just profits that we're looking for. We're really looking to make a positive change. Um, you know, you, you're here on the on the subject of poverty. I've won two green business awards for um, one of my plants, Hemp Homes for Homeless, which is a concept. I'm not sure if anybody here has heard of it, but it's a project out there called the Venus Project. Um, and I designed Hip Homes for Homeless based off of this model to change our current version of society from a monetary-based system to a resource-based system. To where certain things that are just natural-born rights, like clothing, you know, nobody should go without clothes, ever, point-blank period. And the, 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 the clothes that people get, even though it may be free, they don't have to be trash. You can create an a industry to where everybody can have fashionable um, clothing that doesn't necessarily have to be a, a brand name, so to speak. Um, housing should, should be something that everybody should have. Um, basic transportation, you know, we're working on our transportation systems here in America, but there's certain things that we can eliminate by um, removing the profit uh, motive in our industry. So by being able to um, connect to just the, the world and the environment around you, it's a great place to start as far as getting involved in hemp and cannabis. Um, when I moved to California, um, I began working for Cannabis Planet TV. The production studio was out in Sunset Beach. It's a young black kid going out, um, meeting the, the owner of Cannabis Planet TV. He asked me a question. He asked if I knew who Jack Harrow was. Jack Harrow is considered to be the emperor. He, um, he's the man that pretty much fought first the, the, the legislative battles to really get people and get the government to get hemp and cannabis back into our society. And he told me that, um, I told him I didn't know who he was, and he was like, you know, before you get, um, before you go anywhere in this industry, you need to go do your research. Um, and once I did my research, I learned how important it is to to really connect with the people around you when it comes to just outside of business. But as human beings, we've lost that sense of connection as a community. Um, we've been in war for over ten years. You know, some of the stuff that's going on overseas. A lot of these energy wars can be. 
can be avoided by utilizing some of these mindsets that us uh, ego people use. You know, look at people like Elon Musk. He just, you know, with the, with the Tesla and this home battery he just, that he just released, that's going to be able to take people off of the grid and give them energy freedom. Um, you know, so I'm, that's my best advice to people. We're so disconnected, you know, the, 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 the selfie culture, so to speak. You know, it's all about us. We need stuff right now. You know, I think it's about time that we slow down a little bit and, and just really get back to what it is to, to live instead of trying to, to exist, you know, working and paying bills, working and paying bills, day in and day out, just struggling. So I think as a human culture, if, if we want to reconnect again, we'll solve all of our issues and fashion can be a, a huge way for us to reconnect. Um, and utilizing media is going to be the way that we get eco-fashion into the mindsets of people. This is the way that we make fashion culture popular. You know, so putting, putting um, organic cotton items or, or hemp items on celebrities and putting them on TV, those are the ways that we get big business to, to start putting money into, you know, economic, uh, fashionable, and, and ethical standards in their, in their business practices. So learn how to connect people, man. There's tons of, there's no excuse no more. The, the consciousness movement is here. Um, you know, energetically, human beings are, are, are evolving, I say. And um, it, it's unavoidable now. So um, this is a beautiful panel, and I feel connected to everybody right now already. So yeah, connect people, and um, you know, we can get far with that. Thank you. Um, 
just basically have belief team gonna put in cheesecloth bags and package it up. So it'll, it'll be resource coming out here from California. But until the laws break down, we can't transport any kind of bud products. Unfortunately, this is gonna be in, this, and they still have regulations on certain industrial hemp products that we can transport. But in the next year and a half, two years, it'll be kind of an open market um, for us to get stuff. But well, I can we can change contacts and I'll get you in touch with some people I have in the area with fibers and all that other kind of stuff. There's people out here that's playing. Yeah. Right. Did you repeat the question that you had? Yeah, I I just wanted to know right now with the last night you said it just passed the trade agreements. And uh, a lot you know a lot of people are, are divided on the trade agreements because they're very similar to the last trade agreements that, that passed that created the larger problem that we have with overseas manufacturing and very limited protection to human rights for the women It's too early to tell because um, it, it could wind up being more of the same it, and it could change. Um, we, I really, to be honest, I don't know. Um, based on the research that I have done, there really isn't, um, I don't really see a big difference or a big change coming out of this, unfortunately. Um, and it's really too early to tell because it just passed. So I'm, I don't really like the trade agreements that, that are going on right now. I don't think America's being innovative enough. Well, I'm actually pushing for a trade agreement for Virginia and West Virginia. Um, right now we're trying to include Kentucky in that. So we're pushing a big push to try to get uh, the, the country to do some hemp trades. Because um, what's going on now kind of sucks, honestly, I feel. Um, we sat down and spoke with some of the senators about some of the stuff that's going on. And it's just, I don't think it's going to end up good at all because our, I don't know we don't, the foreigners love for us to buy their um, their their products, but they don't like to buy American-made products right now. And so we're trying to come up with a solution to where the foreigners love American-made products again, so we can make tons of money on our trade and actually have manufacturing going on here in our country and not outsourcing all the jobs. Thank you once again, and that concludes our panel for. Uh, tonight. Right. Have a good evening, everyone.